Welcome to the Corporate Director Podcast, where we discuss the experiences and ideas behind what's working in corporate board governance in our digital tech-fueled world. Here, you'll discover new insights from corporate leaders and governance researchers with compelling stories about corporate governance, strategy, board culture, risk management, digital transformation, and more. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Corporate Director Podcast, the voice of modern governance. My name is Dottie Schindlinger, Executive Director of the Diligent Institute, and I'm joined once again by my fantabulous co-host, Rachel Simon, Senior Director of Product Marketing for Diligent Corporation. Rachel, how are you doing today? I'm great, and I'm honored to be bestowed with that uh, really fun uh, extra point Scrabble word. I love it. Is fantabulous in the dictionary? I don't know. I'm pretty sure it it's made be. up. <laughs> it should be. It, it actually just says Rachel Simon when you look in the dictionary. So yeah. that's, you know, there you go. <laughs> I love oh that. My gosh. I need my hype woman with me every day. So uh, let me be your hype woman for a second, though, Dottie. It's a big day around the office with the SEC's announcement on how companies need to disclose on cyber risk. And I know that you have been helping the team internally to understand a little bit about what, what that means. Do you want to share any of the takeaways with our listeners? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're recording this on the day that the open meeting happened. So we now know what is in the final rule. And, you know, uh, spoiler alert, you know, a few of the things that were going to, I think, cause the most agita have been dropped. So for example, they decided to drop the provision to require board members to disclose the level of cybersecurity competency on the board. However, they kept in the provision to require the companies to disclose the level of cybersecurity awareness of the senior management team and of officers of the company. So, you know, it, that's not quite what we thought was going to be in the rule, but not a huge surprise because, of course, that uh, provision really was getting quite a lot of pushback from, from boards and from companies. The other provision, there is, in fact, a four-day window when you have to disclose any major material cyber incident. However, they've also included a carve-out, which I think is quite clever, that you can get a sort of a dispensation, if you will, from the U.S. Attorney General in the event that that cyber incident represents national security. And that that dispensation then would give you extra time to disclose the details of the cyber incident up to 30 days at the maximum. And, you know, that was another big point of contention that a lot of cybersecurity experts went to the SEC and said, hey, look, you know, there are times where we are asked by law enforcement not to talk about things that they are investigating. So what do you want to do? And that was a good point. So now there's a little bit tighter coordination, although I was kind of laughing, thinking the U.S. Attorney General's like, gosh, thanks, guys. I needed more work. <laughs> so <laughs> I feel like the AG's office is already pretty busy right now these days. But um, but hey, you know, I think it is smart to have, you know, that provision such that companies, if they're working in some area where it does represent a material interest on the part of national security, they don't necessarily need to talk about it in four days uh, when things might be little sensitive and there may be active investigation underway and disclosing details about that could make the investigation go pear-shaped. So kind of interesting. There's a lot more to it. Um, definitely encourage you to take it, take a look. We'll include a link to it on the podcast page. By the way, um, we are tomorrow going to be recording an interview with our dear partners at McNeese Wallace, the uh, co-leader of their data privacy and cybersecurity practice, Sandy Garfinkel, really smart attorney. We're going to be sort of debunking what's in the rule, what's not in the rule, what companies should make of this, what do corporate secretaries and boards need to know. So if you're interested, keep an eye out for that. We'll be posting information about that on the podcast page as well. That's super helpful, Dottie. I'm kind of curious on your take in the the statement that we need to disclose what officers have cybersecurity knowledge or expertise. Who do you think begins to kind of get implicated in, in needing that expertise beyond the CISO? The CEO and the CFO come to mind <laughs> because they tend to be officers of the corporation and uh, not that common that either one of them are cybersecurity experts. So I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Um, you know, my guess will be there might be a need to disclose what level of training they've received, mm -hmm. if they've taken any, you know, sort of extracurricular courses or classes or programs that help them get up to speed. You know, what are they doing to just make sure that they know how to adequately oversee these areas of risk? But the bottom line is, I think what the SEC said today is, okay, we get it. 
the board does need to provide information about how they are overseeing cyber risk. But at the end of the day, this is the management's job. And it also was a very clear indication that the buck stops in the CEO's office when it comes to cyber risk, not the CISO's office. And frankly, that's where it should be. And so I think it was kind of interesting. We'll see how this all plays out. But the rule's in effect, and it goes into effect very, very quickly. It will be in effect this fall. So this is not something that companies can kind of start to gear up for and wait around for. And frankly, I don't think that's necessary. You know, if you're a company, you haven't already been figuring out how to disclose cyber incidents. I don't know where you've been. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, this is not the first time you've had to do this. Um, You've been getting lots of pressure from lots of quarters on this. So, you know, not not a terrible... um, short clock or short window, but it is a short window. Well, thank you so much for the rundown. And I'm really looking forward to learning more in the video that you referenced, which will obviously be available by the time you're listening to this podcast. And beyond that, you had a really fabulous interview today. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting that we had this interview today on the day of the SEC announcement because we had the opportunity to speak to Tom Fox, who's the founder of something called the Compliance Podcast Network. Uh, Tom is an attorney for many, many, many years, has been working in the area of ethics and compliance for a long time, kind of had a background in FCPA compliance. But, you know, it was interesting to talk to him today because one of the things that he called out, and you'll hear in the interview – is that there is now this extension of the Caremark standard to officers of the corporation and really in particular to the chief ethics and compliance officer. And, you know, we didn't know the outcome of the SEC rule when we did the interview, but it did get me thinking, you know, I wonder if that's going to potentially also extend to the CISO's office and probably will soon. So kind of fascinating. I I think it, you know, look, it just made for a great conversation to sort of hear what is happening. What does this new rule mean? um, And what should boards be doing about this? What do boards need to know relevant to the new rules on the Caremark standard? So hopefully you'll enjoy the interview. I I know I will. Um, And also, Dottie, I think we wanted to flag that there were some spoilers (laughs) at the end uh, where we ask about what what our our guest has been reading, watching, or listening to. If you haven't seen the last season of Succession, close your ears. (laughs) Yeah, fair, fair warning. You know, many, many people, when we ask that question, what have you read or watched or listened to, mention Succession. Um, You know, Succession ended, the final season ended a few months ago. I think Tom felt safe sharing some spoilers, but spoiler alert, if those of you um, on the podcast have not yet finished Succession, you might want to tune out at that point of the interview. (laughs) So fair warning. Joining us on the Corporate Director Podcast today is Tom Fox, founder of the Compliance Podcast Network. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Donnie, many thanks. And I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Well, we're thrilled to have you here. And especially because you have such a wealth of knowledge about the whole compliance space. And we're going to tie that into how corporate directors should be thinking about compliance. But um, before we get into all of that, why don't we start off by having you tell the audience a little bit more about your background and some of your current work? Sure. So I've been practicing law for 40 years. The first 25 or so, I was a trial lawyer in civil practice. And uh, then I moved into the corporate world and I did international transactions. I lived abroad. And then from there, I became a general counsel at an oil field service company who had sustained a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act violation in 2007. Uh, At that point, it was the highest fine ever assessed, $27 million. That doesn't even make the top 30 anymore. Nevertheless, it was my first experience with compliance. And from that experience, I learned how to build out a compliance program inside of a corporation. That's fantastic. Well, as I mentioned at the top of our introduction here, we wanted to have you come on the show and and just really share an update with our corporate director audience, you know, kind of their their connection to the compliance world, right? Which, you know, for a lot of directors that right now, that might just be when something's gone dreadfully wrong and they drag the compliance officer into a board meeting to talk about it, uh, or they have to get their annual training. But let's, let's talk a little bit more specifically about some of the things happening right now in the Delaware courts. I know there was a recent change to the well-known care market standard for corporate boards, extending those responsibilities to the senior leadership team. So could you tell us a little bit more about that decision and some of the reasoning behind it? Sure. So I hope the boards, any board members listening to this are doing more than just talking to their compliance officers when a problem arises uh, because they are not meeting their legal obligation. Uh, The Delaware courts created what you have correctly articulated is the Caremark Doctrine, and it's a duty of care of boards. 
the Caremark doctrine basically has two components. Number one, you have to have a reporting system to report information up to the board. Um, that's a compliance program. Number two, if information does get to the board, the board must act. It can't simply do nothing. Uh, the Caremark dis, uh, uh, doctrine was created, I think, in 1996. Uh, it percolated along for about 20 years without much change, although it was confirmed by the Delaware Supreme Court. But in 2017, we had a major case called Marchand. And for any aficionado of ice cream, that's the Bluebell ice cream case. Uh, Bluebell, uh, the board completely uh, abrogated their Caremark duty and uh, the Delaware court severely chastised Bluebell, uh, the board, for that, and they settled out of court for $60 million. That number got a lot of people's attentions, and the court's opinion, which articulated some of the actions they expected a board to take, um, which was basically assess your risk, whatever your company's risk is, and manage that risk. Bluebell Ice Cream was an ice cream company with one product, ice cream. They're in the food business. So you better have a food safety committee at the board level, which Bluebell did not. Uh, there were several other cases leading up to Boeing. Boeing, of course, had 737 MAX crashes, two of them. And uh, the board, uh, the court in Delaware found that the Boeing board abrogated their duty there because they accepted management's report that it was basically pilot error, which caused both crashes, and it turns out it was a failure of um, a piece of Boeing software. So uh, starting with Marshawn and then leading up to Boeing, we've had a fairly uh, broad extension of the original Caremark doctrine for boards of directors. But the case you mentioned is uh, at least as interesting and as important because in January of 2023, the Delaware Court of Chancery held that Corporate officers now have the same duty of care as corporate directors around the Caremark duty. This is a significant expansion of the Caremark duty and Caremark obligations. For the compliance officer, for the corporate compliance function, for the chief ethics and compliance officer, it was also highly significant because the court said that in every corporation, your CEO is one of two corporate offices, officers, that have to have visibility across an entire corporation. However, number two was the CCO, not the general counsel, not the CFO, not the uh, head of internal audit, not the uh, head of HR, but the CCO is number two, and you're charged with the duty of having visibility across all parts of your organization. So this was a pretty broad expansion for the chief compliance officer in addition to the creation of a new duty uh, for all corporate officers. So I, I think this is really quite fascinating. I mean, what do you think are going to be the implications of this change for corporate officers? I mean, how how revolutionary a change do you think this is eventually going to be? Or is this just something we need to keep our eye on? Uh, this is, uh, I would say, evolutionary more than revolutionary uh, because the Delaware court pointed to several uh, instances where this had almost been done in the past. So court Law tends to evolve, and I think that's what we had here. But it means that for every corporate officer, you better make sure you're covered by directors and officers' liability insurance because you may well get sued. And specifically for chief compliance officers, it elevates the role of the chief compliance officer very much so within, <clears throat> within a corporation because if we pair that with a pronouncement from the U.S. Department of Justice in the summer of 2020, in a document called the Update to the Evaluation of Corporate Compliance Programs, there it said the CCO had to have visibility across all data sets, data lakes, and data silos in an organization. Well, now we've got the regulators in the form of the Department of Justice saying it. Now we have the Delaware courts, who most U.S. companies, uh, major U.S. companies, are under Delaware law. So it sort of bookends what the DOJ started, and I think it's a significant increase in the responsibility and uh, visibility and authority of a chief compliance officer. You know, that that last point that you just made, Tom, makes me wonder if, I know you can't really see into the future, but if you had your best educated guess, do you think this is going to make it 
a little harder to find people willing to take on, you know, the CCO role. I, it just seems like a pretty unwieldy job already. And, uh, you know, I think about, for example, having visibility into every data set. What do you do once AI becomes the, the primary way that companies are cl- capturing and managing data and it's very opaque? You know, wh- what are your thoughts there? Is this going to become a much harder role to fill? Well, let me leave the AI question to uh, <laughs> answer after I answer the first question about CCO responsibility. What I would say is it requires you as a CCO or a potential CCO to have a very uh, direct conversation about what your authority is, what your budget is going to be in terms of both monetary budget and headcount, and then, of course, um, insurance to protect yourself. And you can protect yourself. You can, uh, with appropriate assurances, make sure you can do your job. The AI question, though, um, to me, AI is a tool. It is uh, the newest tool, perhaps the most expansive tool, but yet just one more tool. And the opaqueness is, where did the information come from? Uh, So if you're going to use AI, what I tell people is, number one, if you're going to use it as as a research tool, recognize that exactly because of what you said, you don't know where the answer is coming from. You already have to know the answer. So I can say to AI, draft me a gifts, travel, and entertainment policy or a conflict of interest policy for a board of directors, and I will get a a decent first draft. But I know what should go in it, so I can review it and say, this is satisfactory. If you don't have that subject matter expertise, AI uh, is really not going to help you. Two, if you're going to use it to summarize documents, that is also an effective tool. But once again, recognize it's just a draft. Uh, you have to edit. And, and I think we've all laughed at the lawyer who got in trouble for filing a brief where he uh, used chat GPT. Well, except that it illustrates what I'm trying to communicate, that you're going to get a first draft of something, and then you have to research what you get to make sure it's correct. Yeah, those are some really, really good suggestions and points. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it's it's interesting too, Tom. One of the things we've been talking about a lot on the Corporate Director Podcast is how expansive the role of the board has become. You know, in these days, when you look at how boards are being comprised, they start to take on a little bit of the character of management teams in, in terms of, you know, bringing people on with new skill sets and, you know, different ways of thinking about the activity of committees. Um, in this case, it's almost like we're seeing the reverse. We're seeing some of the the duties and charges on the board extending to the management team. So I, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are about, you know, what does this mean for the traditional breakdown between management versus governance? You know, are we seeing a blurring of that line? Do you think that's going to be a, an ongoing issue or is that a temporal issue? What are your thoughts? I I don't think it will blur the line because the obligations, the legal obligations and the business duties of both groups are different. Management is there to run the operations of the company, strategic, tactical. A board is there to oversee. Now, a board can take a deep dive into an area, but a board should not be running a corporation. It should not be running operations. It may test, but it should be engaging in oversight to make sure that, number one, set the risk parameters the company wants to operate within and then generally make sure that operations are within those risk parameters. So uh, the facts uh, and legal obligations are there, but I think the duties are very different for both, even though we've said now boards of directors have a care mark duty of care, officers and directors have a care mark duty of care but operationalizing, they're very different. Do you think that we're likely to start to see some uh, cases being mounted against chief ethics and compliance officers for breaching this new extension of the the Caremark standard? What are your thoughts? Uh, I would expect to see that, particularly around if a chief ethics and compliance officer is involved in, in the conduct in question. And there is a very significant legal maxim which says bad facts make bad law. And McDonald's was very bad facts because McDonald's head of HR, who they call the chief people officer, was engaging in ongoing sexual harassment, ongoing multiple relationships, uh, and promoting people he was having those relationships with when the rank and file of McDonald's, both their franchises and corporate workers, were complaining about sexual harassment on the job. 
And that com- those complaints led to public strikes, which got the board's attention. And the board began an investigation. And unfortunately, they cl- included the chief people officer. Well, when you have the person who's engaging in the conduct as part of the investigative committee, you can imagine how bad that is. And so we had the, the, the head of HR, essentially for McDonald's, engaging in the conduct that got the corporation in trouble, which the board at McDonald's appropriately investigated and then changed and then eventually fired that individual. But when you have a head of HR engaging in harassment and the company sued for harassment, if you have a chief compliance officer who engages in bribery and corruption and the company is sued for that, you could very well have a CCO with uh, direct liability. So uh, before we kind of shift the, the focus of our conversation to talk a little bit more about you, because <laughs> that's that's sort of how we like to end every episode of this podcast, um, I want to just ask you your thoughts about any words of wisdom you have for board members listening to this show who maybe don't see enough of their chief ethics and compliance officers in board meetings. Maybe they just are listening to this conversation and they're thinking, you know, we're not hearing enough from those folks. Um, any words of wisdom to share with the board members? The best words of wisdom I can share with the board members. I actually heard at a CLE event in Texas in May, which was be prepared, be there, and ask questions. So read your board material, be at the board meeting, and participate by asking questions. In terms of specifically with your CCO, if you've not seen, if you're visited once a year by your CCO, that is not enough. Uh, and at a minimum, four quarterly reports from your CCO. But if you're the head of the audit committee or you're the head of the compliance committee or you're the head of whatever committee that compliance is under, you need to have a relationship with that CCO. Uh, You need to go visit them personally, have a cup of coffee with them if you're in the same town. Uh, But you have to have a, a relationship where they will pick up the phone and call you if there is an issue so that your company doesn't get caught in anything that could lead to potential legal liability. That's great advice, Tom. Thank you so much for sharing that. Well, as I mentioned, there are three questions that we like to ask every guest who joins us on the show. And so the first one is, what's the biggest difference between boardrooms today and 10 years from now? The biggest difference will be greater officer, excuse me, director specialization. So the U.S. Department of Justice has made clear that a board should have a compliance resource on the board. Uh, And I think now you would say you need a data or a data privacy or a data protection resource on the board. Uh, The days of just having uh, ex-CFOs on the audit committee are not going to be enough. Uh, And whatever the sort of next thing might be, but boards need to have greater specialization. They need to refresh more often and they need to be more engaged um, going forward. That's terrific. Um, And then what's the last thing that you read or watched or listened to that made you think about governance in a new light? Season four of Succession. Oh, yes. (laughs) We're huge fans here on the podcast. Uh, In fact, I did a whole podcast on Succession with a corporate board expert. Oh, that's fabulous. So what what specifically, uh, what aspect would you like to call out? Because there's so much goodness (laughs) or badness, I should say. (laughs) I have to call out the acting, that acting, that Season four to me was some of the greatest acting I'd ever seen on television. And episode three, where Logan Roy dies, was some of the greatest individual acting I'd ever seen, particularly by the children. Uh, Agreed. So uh, it was just fabulous. And and rarely do you see a multi-season TV show uh, end perfectly. But I thought this one ended perfectly. And I'm intrigued to see how Tom does under the new board chair. Madison. (laughs) Agreed. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, And finally, what is your current passion project? So my current passion project is I have long wanted to do a podcast series on Albert Einstein's Annus Mirabilis, which is the year 1905, where he delivered four papers which founded or became the basis of modern physics. His photoelectric effect paper, his Brownian motion paper, his paper on special relativity, and his paper on general relativity. I have a friend who is a double PhD, and we're going to explore these and see how they relate to modern science fiction. Oh, I love it. Oh, that sounds like so much fun. What's the name of the show? Um, We haven't developed the name of the show. We're getting ready to record the episodes uh, and see where it goes. 
Great. Well, when you do, please make sure to check back with us and we'll put a link to it on the podcast page for all of those who are physics slash sci-fi fans, myself included. We will do so. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this has been a really great conversation, a little bit of a, a different different take uh, for our corporate director audience. So I'm delighted to have you join us on the show. Well, Dottie, thank you very much. I look forward to continuing this conversation. We've been joined today by Tom Fox, founder of the Compliance Podcast Network. Tom, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Dottie, thank you so much for that great interview. As always, I just loved all the insight that Tom shared. And honestly, he gave one of the kind of clearest uh, definitions of the Caremark Act. Hearing how that has been on this evolutionary process as well was was really, really interesting. So very much appreciate that. Yeah, the, the Caremark standard, the gift that keeps on giving, it, it keeps getting applied in these new ways, you know, and um, it's going to be kind of fascinating to see to see what happens there. I, I thought one of the points that he made that was kind of fascinating, you know, now that it extends to senior corporate officers, you know, really kind of taking a look at your directors and officers insurance and does it cover your CISO or excuse me, not your CISO, your CCO. I've got CISO on the brain today because of the cybersecurity rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like that, that sort of extension of that coverage and that liability protection for more than just the board and CEO and CFO is um, becoming really critical. I thought that was a good point. Absolutely. Uh, and I really appreciated the the point that you raised about how much more difficult it might be to actively recruit people that want that level of responsibility. That was a really interesting discussion, but it sounds like from Tom's perspective, it's something that yeah, it's a hard job, but you you can get the right insurance and the right coverage. It just needs to be something that um, is kind of considered by by the company and that risk factor. Yeah, I, I also thought it was interesting, you know, kind of at the very end of the interview, if you tuned back in after pausing for the spoiler, mm -hmm. um, you know, we asked it, we always ask that question about what's the biggest difference between boardrooms today and 10 years from now. And he brought up something we've talked about a few times on the podcast, and that is greater director specialization. So having more you know, specialist board members, as opposed to just a team of current and former CEOs and CFOs, um, you know, having people that have expertise on data privacy or on compliance or on all these other just different areas that the board is now taking a much more active role in overseeing. And, you know, we, we again, we've talked about that a few times before. I just thought it was really inter interesting to hear how he put that together. Uh, and I think that he's probably right. That probably is what the future holds in terms of board recruitment. Absolutely. Uh, I really loved the examples that he was sharing. The McDonald's one kind of jumped mm -hmm. out to me as being a really great example of how boards need to maybe think and engage differently with their compliance officers and really have, have thought through how that investigative process needs to work and how they need to be involved in case the person that they're investigating might have actually been around the table in a situation like that. So great words of wisdom there. Well, and the, the only other thing I'll mention um, before we wrap up here, Rachel, is, you know, I, I had to throw him the question about AI, right? Because AI is on everybody's minds. Um, and, and it was also on my mind today. One of the other things we didn't talk about in the SEC announcements today was they've proposed yet a new rule. Um, and the new rule that they have proposed is that there needs to be some investigation of whether or not there's a potential conflict of interest if um, an organization is using sort of algorithmic or automated trading software um, and they're within a finance firm. And so I, I don't have enough details. I'm not smart enough to share details right now. I need to get much better briefed. But it is it is an example of the 18 gajillion ways we're about to see AI potentially get regulated. You know, who would have thought that AI would get regulated at the SEC? And yet here is a provision that is specifically about the use of AI in in markets. Um, I think it's going to be really fascinating to see how this plays out because I, you better believe we're going to start to see these same kinds of regulations coming from many agencies across the federal government and outside the U.S. as well. It's going to be very interesting to watch. Between the SEC, the Delaware court, and the evolving technology, there's no shortage of <laughs> governance topics and it's just a <laughs> moving target. We're, we've, we've got job security now, huh? <laughs> Right. Remember, remember when we thought that governance might get boring? <laughs> Never. 
<laughs> never, never, never. Well, Rachel, thanks for joining me again on the podcast. Um, this has been an episode of the Corporate Director Podcast, the voice of modern governance. Once again, I'm Dottie Schindlinger, joined by the indomitable Rachel Simon. I'd like to say a few special thank yous, first and foremost, to our wonderful compliance expert, Tom Fox, to our podcast producers, Kira Ciccarelli, Edna Frimpong, and Sophia Hadef, the team at Oxenfree for making this podcast a reality, and most especially, Diligent Corporation for sponsoring the show. Hey, drop us a line, will you? We'd love to hear from you at diligent.com slash podcast or by email at podcast at diligent.com. And if you like this show, please be sure to check out our sister show, Inside Today's Boardrooms, presented by Diligent Institute, a weekly web show covering best practices for today's corporate boards and committees by going to insights.diligent.com. And if you love podcasts, don't forget to listen to Insightia, a Diligent Brands podcast beyond the boardroom. You can enjoy news and brief episodes where host Kieran Poole is joined by Insightia journalists to discuss the biggest corporate governance stories, feature interview episodes with industry experts, and episodes where Insightia's latest reports are explored. Search Insightia Beyond the Boardroom wherever you get your podcasts and make sure to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening. You've been listening to the Corporate Director Podcast. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you'd like to learn more about corporate governance and tools to help directors do their job better, visit www.diligent.com. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time. <laughs>